Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation entitled Incident Response 101. If it hits the fan, will you have a plan? Great, great title, love that. Shortly, I'll be handing over to Steve Watts, who is Head of Security Operations for Aldmore Bank. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of very quick reminders. Please do use the polls function uh, to the right of your viewing pane to ask any questions. I'll then field those uh, with Steve at the end of the session. If, and if you haven't already, please do click the theatre mode button, uh, which is just underneath the, uh, the viewing pane. Uh, you'll get a full screen experience, which will be, uh, be much better for you. Uh, and with that, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to hand over to uh, Steve. Over Thank to you. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. I appreciate that. Right. Thanks for joining me, everyone. I appreciate your time today. I know everyone's busy at the moment, so uh, we'll do appreciate you giving up some time to uh, listen to my presentation. So uh, Matt's already introduced me, but just to extend a little bit on that, I'm the Head of uh, Security Operations at Aldermore Bank. Uh, previous experience includes uh, working in a number of roles across cyber threat intelligence uh, and incident response as well for a number of uh, large companies. Uh, but the reason we're here today, obviously, is not to talk about me, just to get into incident response. So uh, rule number one, sounds quite obvious have a plan and um, but if you uh, take a look at these stats that have come out of ibm's recent survey they've uh, found that 74 percent of organizations are actually still reporting that the plans are either ad hoc inconsistent or worse still in some situations companies don't actually have a cyber uh, incident response plan uh, so first advice at this point is to get something on paper get something down something is is normally better than than nothing at all with that said uh, this is not a plan. Um, so this is not where we want to be. And uh, the reason I call this out is because recently I was on an interactive uh, incident response um, event and the question was asked uh, at a point within the uh, scenario whether or not um, the, the uh, respondents would consider uh, chopping the internet access uh, if, if uh, an incident was, was formed. This particular scenario was a mailbox box breach in Office 365. So obviously uh, that's, that's not necessarily what we want to be doing, cutting off inter internet access. We need something that's a little bit more structured in terms of how to respond to that incident. So the best thing that we need to do is, is take a look at uh, the, the incident response lifecycle. There's a number of uh, life cycles that you can choose from NIST, UDA, and this one in front of you at the moment is SANS. Um, but again, choose one and just try and get something down on paper to say something is better than nothing. We're looking for progress on this, not perfection. So start off and just get some idea of how you would approach this uh, if something was, was to happen. So um, briefly take you through each of these. They're pretty much what they say on the screen, but the preparation phase is... Um, is getting that plan together. It's doing some uh, basic risk assessment and threat assessments to, to help inform uh, the process. Uh, identification, so the steps that you're going to take to identify an actual incident and separate it from uh, just BAU events that you're likely to see. Containment, obviously um, damage limitation at that point. Once you're in the middle of an incident, how do you contain it and make sure it doesn't get any worse? Eradication, obviously removing that threat or that incident from your environment. Recovery, so getting back to BAU and uh, getting back to, to green and how things should be normally. And then one of the important things, obviously, lessons learned. So once you've run through that process, what is it that you can do to make your next incident go, um, go more smoothly? Now, I also add two things to stand uh, to some standard um, life cycle. Also make sure that there's a wraparound there for uh, communication. Uh, again, seems quite obvious, but uh, communication really is key, both within your incident response team to make sure you're uh, collaborating uh, and documenting all of the uh, steps that you're taking. Uh, also, internal communications with, with your staff. Make sure your staff are aware of what's going on and they're given the right information to be able to brief out, especially if you have a call centre function. Make sure you've got some scripts though in place to deal with the customer uh, inquiries that may be coming in. Uh, and obviously, uh, external communications to key stakeholders, your clients, and even the regulators and law enforcement, if you need to do that at that particular point. And one of the probably the most important things, certainly for me, um, when it comes to incident response is, is the care element. So this is making sure that your teams are uh, looked after and all the way through the um, all the way through the incident when they're under pressure, 
uh, when they're really feeling uh, the, st the stress of that incident, making sure that you're looking after them, you're feeding them, you're watering them, you're giving them breaks when they need to, really important. We've seen some uh, large cyber incidents recently where it's got that, um, that difficult for the incident responders to, um, to manage the workload that they've actually walked out. And that's not what you want in the middle of an incident is to lose some of your key staff. So uh, care is absolutely paramount at that, that, uh, that point in time. So moving along, we move into preparation. First thing to say is assume breach. We hear it all the time. Everybody's got the great antivirus solutions, uh, principles of defense in depth, least privilege, those types of things. But so do all of the uh, major companies that end up getting breached and being on the, on the front page. So, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best is, is really the, the key takeaway from, from this one. Uh, again, don't assume that you're too small or uninteresting for attackers. Uh, hear that in a number of companies and, and speaking to peers within the in industry. You could just be collateral damage. Um, so in, in this, uh, the shape of WannaCry, uh, or you could be the weakest link in, in the supply chain um, going up to the actual target victim. So you might just be a hop in, as part of the, the, attacker's, um, the attacker's plan, if you like, from that perspective. Um, really important that you understand your environment, understand your assets. If you don't understand your assets, you don't know where you're looking for any problems. You don't know what it is that you're looking to protect. So uh, asset inventory and visibility of those assets is really, really important, as is establishing baselines, understanding what uh, good looks like um, so that you can look at any deviations from that that, that could be sparking an, an incident as well. So um, again, understand your data. Where does your data live? What is the classification of that information? Where do you expect it to move around? Where should it Where are the types of places you wouldn't expect to see it? And a critical one, especially with the amount of human operated ransomware that we're seeing um, at the moment, make sure that you back up your data. Again, a really obvious one. Um, but what we're seeing is that the um, criminals are going for backup systems as soon as they get access to, uh, to the environment going for the backup systems and using administrative privileges to delete any backups. So one piece of advice is make sure that your backups are offline. As soon as they finish, make sure they're not available to the system to be able to be deleted so that you can go back and recover those uh, should you need to. Um, so in terms of uh, threats, understand, once you've understand your assets, understand um, who it is that may want to target those. Uh, and how they are likely to do that, what are the key tactics and techniques that they would use to target you. That will give you an idea of the types of incident response and playbooks that you'll need to put together. So do some, use, uh, do some criminals use DDoS as part of their uh, methods? Do they use ransomware? We're looking at more SQL injection. That will give you an idea of the types of uh, incidents and the response plans that you, that you need to put in place. Um, Obviously, your response plans are key. Like I say, make sure that you do have those. And, and uh, one of the key things is to make sure that you test those. Test them and make sure that the testing that you carry out is realistic. We don't want to be doing uh, tick box exercises just to be able to say that you've done this. We want the right people in the room uh, to give a really good simulation as to what would happen uh, in the event of, of, a, of a cyber attack. Um, and also, don't be afraid to... Um, don't be afraid to get in external consultants, experts. You won't necessarily have in-house, um, you know, in-house uh, skills to be able to do this yourself. So uh, make sure that you do go externally if you need forensic investigation uh, or other key skills that, that you may not necessarily have within your company at the time. Uh, and, and another key thing is communications. Uh, make sure you, you know exactly how you're going to communicate out to your stakeholders. Um, get some boilerplate um, messages put together already so you're not starting from scratch in the middle of an incident uh, and make sure that you know how they're going to go out. Are they going to go out via SMS or via call center scripts and that sort of thing? Um, are you going to update your website or send emails? Um, just have a, have a clear idea of who's going to send those messages, uh, messages out and, and uh, to whom as well. And as I say, one of the key things is make sure that you, you continue to practice um, this, this plan and make sure everyone is aware of what they need to do. So in terms of identification, it's normally uh, sometimes can be quite easy. So a user will say that they've clicked on a link and they'll report that. Uh, sometimes a website will go offline. So all quite clear indications that something has happened. But more often than not, we're going to need to look for deviations from your uh, standard baseline that we talked about earlier on in the preparation phase. So understanding uh, how the landscape has changed compared to what you'd normally expect to see. 
uh, you know, an increase in uh, system resources being used, new processes being created uh, or unusual ones being created or strange traffic flows as well. Those types of things you need to be able to uh, spot those within your environment and, and to be able to dig into those and see if it's actually a, a, an incident. Assuming that, that it is and you call an incident, make sure that as you're triaging that, you've not got some very good intention people going in and, and damaging any forensic evidence that, that you may need to preserve to uh, in, increase your chances of, of a, a quick turnaround on your incident, especially if you need to engage law enforcement. You don't want people going in and, and uh, deleting evidence accidentally by rebooting servers or killing process, processes, that sort of thing. Again, if you're not sure on how to do that, make sure you've got an expert on hand to be able to assist you if that's needed. And another key one that not a lot of people uh, often think about is look out for misdirection. So if you've got a DDoS attack occurring, is that the actual the primary attack that's occurring or is that used being used as a bit of a smoke screen to take your attention while something else occurs, maybe a SQL injection on your website that you're not necessarily looking out for. So um, just be mindful for that as well. And then uh, once you've, you've identified it, next thing to do is, is to contain the incident, obviously stop pouring the petrol onto the fire, make sure that you do that damage limitation. It's very easy at this stage to um, be bogged down in trying to get into the detail or, or responding to executive um, requests for updates. What we advise here is make sure you've got somebody that's doing the containment, that's really got the hands on um, damage control and then have somebody else totally separate providing the update to, to the, the relevant people so that not you've not got one person trying to juggle two jobs containment is absolutely key at this point so make sure that that's uh, that that's taking place and um, something to consider whilst you're going through your containment is it's always going to be a balance of containing something and also preserving forensic evidence as well and um, so uh, what I do suggest here is that you get some initial instant uh, response forensic training First responders, first responder training, a lot of uh, organizations, third parties will provide that for you, just so you've got a basic understanding of the types of information that you're going to need to uh, get before you, before you switch off your servers or uh, sever any connections and that sort of thing. Um, and again, uh, communication is, is key as well at this stage. Make sure that everyone's aware of what's going on. Uh, make sure everybody has been given the right tasks and that you've got somebody, an incident manager, at that stage that is uh, allocating those tasks and staying with that person, the, the task owner, getting updates from them all the time to make sure that nothing's been lost and, and things are progressing. Okay, um, so next one, eradication and recovery. So uh, it goes without saying, we need to get rid of the threat. We need to um, minimize it. We've already minimized the damage. Now we just need to remove the threat from the network and return back to BAU. Uh, the really important point at this stage is do not move into the recovery phase until you're really confident that the eradication phase is completed. If you've not closed those back doors off, all that's going to happen is you'll start recovering your servers, start uh, kicking off your backups, and then before you know it, the, the threat actors are in the back door again, and you've got to start, start from scratch. So be really clear that before you start recovering uh, your systems to BAU, you've absolutely uh, nailed the eradication process. Um, and so on that, the eradication process, make sure that we're um, removing any, any backdoors or malicious artifacts that may have been implanted as part of uh, that incident. That like, could include things like deleting any new accounts, any backdoors that were created, changing passwords on key systems, uh, and implementing any necessary firewall changes uh, or patches that, that need to occur as well. Uh, and then when we do move over to the uh, recovery phase, we need to make sure that we depending on the incident, if you've had a malware incident or some sort of uh, malware incident like that, you would need to uh, potentially look to restore from scratch. Rebuild your servers at that point, they're compromised and you can't confirm that you've actually removed anything like a root kit, you know, so a hidden malware uh, program in, the, in, the, uh, in memory that uh, is going to be very difficult to detect. So at that stage, you, you really need to be going back to uh, a known good operating system and uh, obviously restoring over on top of that your, your last known good backup, assuming that you've got one because you took it offline in the first place. Um, so once you've, you've got that system back up and running, really important to make sure that you patch it and that you test it so that you're running your vulnerability scans on those servers 
uh, making sure there's, there's no more vulnerabilities on the penetration testing as well. I would advise that certainly for externally facing assets, if it's an external website that's been compromised, make sure you've, you've got some penetration testing on there before, um, before you go live as well. And then um, it's, this is, as you're rebuilding these services and you're putting them uh, live, it's a really good opportunity for you to, um, to, to fix some of the issues that may have led to this in the first place, such as your lack of monitoring. So ensure that that system that you're putting back online uh, goes into your SIEM system. You're getting the relevant logs from it so that you, you're moving forward in, the, in a positive way. Okay, and again, the really important one is lessons learned. You know, there's going to be some things that went really well, so make sure that they are called out you, you, uh, in, in your uh, update report, your incident report that you need to pull together. But there are going to be some things that could have happened or that you just won't have been able to plan for, you know. Um, so call, make sure that they are called out, whether that's as a problem ticket or uh, a risk that you put onto your risk register to get the, the relevant visibility of that within your company. But make sure that those things are i uh, call out so that you can actually fix these and improve your processes uh, going forward. Um, that could include some new, new use cases for SIEM. If you know that uh, your SIEM wasn't configured properly and you could have maybe detected it earlier, uh, then absolutely go ahead and put, put those new use cases in. If your protection um, protections weren't adequate enough, either they were totally missing or they just weren't configured in the right way, then take the opportunity to go back and, and to harden uh, those particular controls. Um, really important as well to go back and update any policies that may have helped you to, um, to avoid the incident in the first place. Um, and that doesn't necessarily just include um, technical policies and standards, but, you know, did the incident get reported quickly enough? Did people understand what the incident reporting process was? If not, then maybe it's an uh, opportunity to update that policy and to push out some user awareness comms um, to your users so they know exactly how to report an incident or a suspected incident to you as well. Uh, and, and really, as I say, you need to go back and practice these, uh, the, your incident response plan, uh, whether that's tabletop exercises, uh, you know, sitting down and running through a mock incident in a controlled environment, that's one way to do it. Uh, certainly, if it's the first time you've done this, uh, I would recommend sitting down in a more controlled environment and, and talking that through. Once you've got a little bit more confidence around your incident response plan and all of the key stakeholders have been involved in, in those, uh, that, those kind of cyber threat exercises, uh, and those exercises need to include not just technical people, they need to include your comms and uh, HR, your risk teams, uh, those types of teams as well, everyone that's got uh, some, um, some uh, skin in the game when it comes to actually the, the, uh, responding to an incident, make sure that they're, they're all comfortable with it. Once they are, then the next thing I would highly recommend is doing uh, a bit more of a red team type exercise, you know, where you don't necessarily know when something's going to occur um, and testing it in more of a real scenario. It's all very well and good sitting around a table uh, and, and talking things through when everyone's nice and calm, you know, a few biscuits, cups of tea. Uh, everyone taking the time to work through something very different when there's people missing from your team in a live environment or you know there's a system that's failed if your email is part of the compromise and you can't send emails these are the types of things that really hands-on red team type testing and live fire type testing will, will actually draw out um, and, and allow you to test and see how you would respond to that as well Okay, uh, so as I say, key important things as well to finish up with are um, care is really important. Make sure that through all of this process, your incident response process, you're looking after your staff. Uh, they're going to be potentially highly stressed. There's going to be a lot of um, a lot of things asked of them uh, under pressure. So make sure that you're looking after them. And again, comms is key. So care and comms, but above all else, keep calm and carry on. You will get through the incident. Um, you will you will make it through. Uh, all, all the more uh, better if you've got that incident response plan that's been tested as well. So um, just in summary, I won't go through all those points. They're there for you if you want to uh, screen capture those or for the recording. But um, yeah, feel free to reach out to myself. I recognize it's uh, quite a quick presentation. There's a lot to go through uh, in, in just a short amount of time. I could probably spend an hour on each of the, the phases there. So uh, hopefully that's given you a bit of... Um, kind of food for thought, uh, some questions, and if nothing else, maybe uh, give you some opportunities to go back review your incident response plans and, uh, and make some changes there that will help you in the future.
Brilliant. Okay. Thanks so much for that, Steve. That was uh, that was really really interesting. I've I've personally learned quite a few things in that. So thank you so much for that. Um, let's just have a look over here. Uh, just trying to field uh, a couple of questions. Um, okay. Here, here's an interesting one. Um, I'm the only person in IT. Uh, do I really need a detailed plan? If you're the only person, you don't need a detailed one, I guess, as long as you, you yourself know the steps, uh, you know what to go through. It's always good to have that documented just in case you're you're not around. If you're the single point of failure, that, that's an issue. And obviously, you probably need to escalate that as a risk, assuming that's been done. Um, but definitely document it. It doesn't necessarily need to be detailed if you're going to be the only person from IT doing it because you, 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 you don't kind of know what you're doing. But make sure that, as I say, Instant response isn't just IT, it's about the business as well. So ensure that uh, your, your business continuity plans, your instant response plans include the wider, peop uh, wider people so that you know who you're, you're interfacing with as well. And that, that, that part of it, definitely make sure it's documented so everyone is clear on the roles and responsibilities that they've got when you're in that uh, incident scenario. Okay, great. Um, we've got a load of questions now just popped through. Uh, What's the first thing you should do if you suspect a breach? I think the first thing to, if you suspect a breach is, is you need to do that triage. Um, it, it really depends on, on what the suspicion of, of the breach is and how confident you are at that point. Uh, all too often, I, I see, I've seen previously, where something will come in that, that looks like an incident, but when you dig in, you do that triage and you, you jump on, on top of it, it's actually a, a false positive. It, it's, not, it's not worthy of spinning something up. So definitely take your time to go and, uh, and look at, at your suspicions and just validate those and make sure they're an actual incident. So that, that's, my, that's my key thing because nobody wants to be the boy who cried wolf. Uh, you know, and, and be reacting to false positives all the time. Make sure it's an actual incident before you start spending up your resource and dealing with it. Mm. And that, that's actually a really, really nice hook into this next question that somebody has shared. Uh, how long do you spend on identifying the breach? Uh, I'm thinking you can see the consequences, but not the cause. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, I think you, you really do need to spend, it's a difficult one. The answer is going to be, it depends. It depends on the scenario. Some of them are going to be really obvious. You might have skull and crossbones on the screen. It's ransomware. We know what's going on. We need to do something and need to move through the life cycle. Other times you will need to bring other people in just to verify, uh, verify your suspicions. Um, but ultimately, if you can help yourself by making sure you've got those baselines of what normal looks like, because then it should be a lot easier to identify when you have got something that's high confidence in terms of an incident. Okay, and uh, fi final one, I guess, unless we can squeeze this in really quickly. Um, I'll throw it in there anyway. Is it worth paying a ransom to avoid data loss or data leaks? I expected this one. Um, so. Uh, Again, I think that it depends. It's really driven by business, uh, business appetite for risk. But also one thing I would say in this situation is we've seen uh, laws change, especially in America recently, to say that paying a ransom ransomware uh, ransom could be illegal you know you, you could be funding terrorism or you've got sanctions and dealings with sanctioned countries those types of things so my advice at that point would be phone a friend you know you need to be speaking to those experts and taking their advice whether they're incident response responders or you can also get um, expert ransomware negotiators that will be able to help you but they should be able to provide the legal uh, advice around that as well so absolutely make sure that you cover that off from a legal perspective yeah, great, great, great question. Uh, to be fair to it, I, I guess the one thing that I'd add to that to wrap up is um, a question around just because you pay the ransom, does it actually mean to say that you're going to get your data back or whatever unlocked? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, yeah, there's, there's no guarantee uh, and there's no guarantee that it won't come back, you know, with the best will in the world from these criminals that say that they won't come back to you. Um, you, you can't guarantee that. And, and all you're doing is you're just... Uh, perpetuating the, the you know uh, the cr criminal uh, criminals um, kind of mo really you're giving them a reason to continue to do it so uh, but yeah it really depends if, if the only way you can get your business back is to do that then certainly look to the experts to, to help you make a decision there okay brilliant excellent thank you uh, so much for that steve that was that was great that was that was really really brilliant for us um <laughs> Right, folks, that's the end of, uh, of this particular session. Uh, we have uh, a panel session starting in the IT stream in around about five minutes. 
uh, looking at uh, remote working um, and the current the current scenario that we face around um, working from home and, and cybersecurity in a, in a pandemic world. Um, or alternatively, in the business leaders stream, there is a presentation looking at how much your business really needs to spend on uh, on cybersecurity, which uh, for some people is is a really really big big question that needs to be answered. So enjoy the uh, the rest of today's sessions, uh, Steve. Thanks so much for that. Um, that's, the end, that's the end of the session. Uh, goodbye for now. Thanks everyone. Cheers, guys.